Good morning, everybody. Welcome, Court of Family and guests. We're so happy to have you this morning. I'm Jeff Dotson, Senior Relationship Partner at Corda Dallas. I am joined by my colleague, Kim Deutsch out of Houston. Good morning, Kim. Good morning. We're glad you could join us today. Kim and I will be your co-host today and the third member of our panel. You'll see on the screen there, the real star of the show, Dr. Nancy Schlossberg. Good morning, Nancy. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. We're happy to have you. Our title of this, the webinar this morning is How to Become or Stay, if you're already a happy retiree. We really think uh, the message that Nancy uh, talks about today in the transitions in retirement can help. And quite frankly, even if you're not retired um, or whatever really stage you are in life, I really think the message and the heart of the message will ring true. So we really think you'll get a lot out of this. Um, before I turn it over to Nancy, a couple of uh, housekeeping items and uh, I'll go over the agenda and then we'll, we'll get started. First, the housekeeping items. So if you're new to Zoom, this is a Zoom webinar. So you can see us as a participant and hear us, hopefully. We cannot see or hear you. We have about 100 people on this webinar. Uh, we're really glad you decided to join us this morning and carve out part of that. But we probably don't need background noise for 100 people. Nobody's going to be happy if that happens. So uh, you may see a cat cross Kim's lap or... <laughs> Uh, something crazy like that, uh, you're feel free to, 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 uh, to, to, to video that, but uh, we cannot see you. So you, you can't turn on your video or audio and uh, hopefully that'll help. However, we do want this to be interactive as much as we possibly can. So if you'll take just a second and take your mouse and hover most likely near the bottom of your screen, you should see four or five icons. One of those icons is Q&A which stands for question and answer. And that's the way we'll communicate in today's webinar. So if you have a question, whether it's something Nancy's speaking about at the moment, or just something that you want her to address, Kim and I will do our best to monitor that during the meeting. And um, it, it, we'll monitor that and ask the questions. We'll try to get to all those questions. If we, We'll probably carve out maybe five minutes at the end as well. Kind of do a little bit of a rapid fire and, and answer those questions. So we would encourage that. We appreciate you doing that and we'll keep an eye on that. Agenda for the day is a little bit of a fireside chat type feel to it. Again, Kim and I will uh, act as a co-host and, and interact with Nancy. We really want to uh, you to hear her story. She's kind of got three main topics that she'll cover. Um, about 45 minutes is what you can expect in terms of time with this. It will be recorded by the way. So if you have a friend uh, that wanted to attend that, that missed it or you think could benefit from it, we'll send that out in the next couple of days after the, um, after the meeting today. Okay, so let's get on with Dr. Nancy Schlossberg. We've had, Kim and I have had a, an opportunity to get to know Nancy over the last couple of months. We really have tried to bring in an expert in a non-financial field that ties in with the message that we preach at Corda. Which is, which is obviously enjoy the fruits of your labor, but there's a lot more to it than money. And I think that's where Nancy and her message and her research really ring true. She's got a, a unbelievable background. She spent her, uh, we'll call it the main part of her career. Cause I don't, I think she probably would admit she's, <laughs> she's having a hard time retiring. Uh, so I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even consider her retired. Uh, but she spent the main part of her career as, an, uh, a, a career as a professor, most notably University of Maryland for 25 years. She's written nine books and she's been a guest on a number of media programs uh, at PBS, CBS News. The list goes on, written for a number of publications. We're thrilled to have her. Nancy, welcome and thank you for coming. Jeff, I had to laugh when you said I'm not retired. My daughter keeps telling me the only thing retired about you is your paycheck. And uh, <laughs> that seems to be what it is. But let me just give you a little background how I got here. Um, I've been a woman who worked, had a family and worked 
all along, which when I was coming along was kind of unusual. But I had a feminist husband, a supportive husband, and I had wonderful opportunities. So I've been at several universities. The last and longest was my, uh, I feel like it's my alma mater, but it isn't, uh, the University of Maryland College Park. But how did I get in to my major work of transitions? And that happened after uh, I had already was in the midst of my career. I had a geographical move. It's one I wanted. It's one I planned for. I was moving back from Detroit back to Washington. I had a marvelous job at the American Council on Education as their first woman executive. I had a best friend who lived in the area, a husband and two children. Perfect, right? Piece of cake, except it wasn't. And I couldn't figure out why I was having difficulty with this transition I controlled, I initiated, and all, all, all the pieces were in place. And that started me trying to figure out and learn about transitions. And I did a number of research studies, but I studied geographical moving. That was my first because that's what brought me to it. I studied at Goddard Space Flight Center, and the NASA. I had a wonderful opportunity there because our department at Maryland had a contract with Goddard Space Flight Center. So I was, and when they had a RIF, reduction in force, a forced retirement, um, my colleague and I interviewed every single person and we followed them up six months later. I could spend a whole hour on what I learned from that study. And that's what you can't, if you want to understand transitions, it's never one point in time. Then I started studying adult learners. Then I went into non-events. A non-event is a transition that you expected and did not happen. And how do you handle that? How do you ritualize that? Then I retired from Maryland. And again, I initiated it. They didn't want me to go. They didn't want to lose a line. And it was my idea. So I retired. And guess what? It wasn't so great. Uh, I struggled with it. I was very committed to my work. And even though I thought it was time to retire, and even though I initiated it, I struggled. So when you struggle with something, then you need to understand it. And to, that's when I started looking into retirement. So Jeff, does that give you the background you want? Yeah, that's a great background, Nancy. And I think you, you said a couple of things that I think will, will ring true to our clients. I mean, I, unfortunately, we do see it where, where people work their entire lives, have been terrific savers, done all the right things, and sort of get to the the finish line, if you will, of retirement, as you just touched on with your own personal experience, uh, or, or unfulfilled in, in whatever, for whatever reason. So if you would, you've got a great quote, and I'll just kind of read it here, or a great statement that, that really sort of uh, hit me when I read it. Um, it, it. Understand that retirement is a series of transitions, not a date. And I think, you know, I know we're guilty in the financial world of talking about a date. Hey, when would you like to retire? And let's get to that finish line. And, and we're just assuming that everything past that is, is, is wonderful. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, well, let me start with the definition. We all use the word transition and we all know what it means, but I think it's important to define it. And this is the way in my research I came to define it. A transition is an event like retirement, becoming a grandparent, getting promoted. It's an event or a non-event. Something doesn't happen. You finally realize you're never getting promoted. 
uh, you're not getting the retirement you thought you could afford and plan for. So a transition is an event or a non-event that changes your life. And it changes your role from retire from worker to retiree. And that's whether you're a blue collar worker, like a roofer, a judge, uh, a lawyer, uh, whatever it is you are, once you retire, your role changes from worker to non-worker. Your relationships change, both with your colleagues, the people you saw every day on the job. As one man said to me, I don't miss my job, I miss the schmoozing. <laughs> uh, so you changed your roles, you change your relationships, and not just with colleagues, but at home and with your family. One woman told me in a workshop, she said, I'm retired now and my kids expect me to babysit and I really don't wanna do that all the time. Now there are people who do wanna babysit, but it changes your relationships with your family, what they expect of you, what you expect. So you've changed your role, your relationship. A very important change is your daily routines. You know, you, drop, you know where you're gonna drop the cleaning off on your way to work, pick up your coffee. Uh, you have a routine for your life. And when you exercise, all kinds of things. And routines are really so important. A Wall Street Journal reporter wrote a wonderful article that she couldn't get over how upset she was when they changed her office configuration and arrangement. And the routine of not being able to go to the desk and the place that she had gone to for years just struck me as a very, I mean, it wasn't a big deal, but routine changes become big deals. And the fourth thing is it changes your assumptions about yourself and the world. So think about this for a minute. The more in your life that everything has changed, that's a big transition. If only, let's say you move from one apartment to another in the condo where you're living, that's a change of routines, that's a change, but not like moving to another city or to a new job. So it's like, gives you like a barometer of what's going on how much it changes your roles, relationships, routines, and assumptions. And this is for every transition, not just retirement. But there's more to it than just understanding the degree to which it changes your life. And by the way, that's why a happy transition, like my move that I described initially, even happy transitions can be upsetting and challenging because so much in your life is changing. So, but there's more to transitions than that. First, the degree to which it changes your life. Second, where you are in the transition process. Is this your first meeting with Carta? Is this the first time you've talked to your financial person? Is this the first time that you've asked the question, can I afford to retire and when? That's then. Then actually, you retire the R day. And then six months later, you begin to question, should you have retired? How is your retirement working out? And then 10 years later, you look back and it's a process over time. And that's what I learned from the NASA study. We interviewed them the week they had got the notice that their jobs were eliminated. They were devastated. Followed them up six months later. And by the way, to my shock, most of them were very happy. But the reason, and this is important for organizations to understand, NASA attached everyone whose job was eliminated to an HR person. So that person had a buddy until that person found a new set of roles, relationships, routines, and assumptions. So you begin to picture it. 
here's your life. Here you're gonna, your new life. And in between is this up and down period where you have all kinds of mixed emotions, second guessing yourself. So I think that's enough, enough about transitions, but it's, it's just a general thing. And by the way, you often, even if you want to retire or you want to move or you want to get married, you have so many mixed emotions during this middle period, what the anthropologists call luminality. I love that name. But you have so, so much going on and it's idiosyncratic. I cannot, I'm not a stage theorist. I can't tell you, this is how you'll feel at the beginning and this is how you'll feel six months later. What I can tell you is you will feel differently. And now that I look back on a 20 year retirement, I look at it very differently than I did that first six months when I wondered, why did I do this? Uh, what, what is my new purpose? Uh, so transitions are happening all the time, whether it's retirement or other things, it's not a date. And that's Jeff, what I meant. It's not a date. Nancy, one, one last follow-up to that before we move to the next uh, section. So, you know, I think of our own clients that we, we, we talk to, and, and I think they, they almost fall into two camps. You've got, and I literally just talked to one yesterday that's retired, been retired about, um, oh, I don't know, six, eight months. And um, in that particular person, we tried to set a, a follow-up meeting and he made the joke, hey, I'm, I'm so busy with my retirement, I, I, I don't have time to meet. And then, you know, we talked to others that uh, had just retired and fall into the camp that you talked about earlier, which is, um, you know, they're a little bit, uh, I don't know, nervous, regretful that they did it or, 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 or concerned. Saying all that, I'm thinking for the clients on the line that maybe are just retired or, or, or about to and are nervous, do you have any tips? I know you talk about maybe keeping your dance card full. I've, I've heard you say that a couple of times. Is, is there sort of any practical advice of, as they're just making that leap to retirement that would help? Well, I'm, I'm a counseling psychologist and a cognitive psychologist. And there are people who are, and, and by that, and why it's important to say that, is that I think if you have an understanding, a cognitive understanding, a map of what you might be going through, of the confusion to expect it, if you have a cognitive map, that you're better able to deal with it. There was a book many years ago written by a uh, writer, uh, not a psychologist, called Widow. And she uh, was widowed and did some crazy things. She moved, she had two children, she just did crazy things. And she said at the end of the book, if I had known that there would be an end, that I would get a new life, if I had even recognized that these feelings, these, uh, the ambivalence, the mix up, if I had had some understanding of the transition process, I would have been better able to handle it. So it, I mean, and the shock to me was here I am, supposedly an expert on transitions, and I should have expected that the move would be upsetting, that could be upsetting, that retirement, because I did a dumb thing. I re my husband and I retired and we moved at the same time to another state. Now, you know, that doesn't make sense, but we did it anyway. So all I'm saying is that it, you don't know how you're gonna feel when you no longer have the life that you are used to. So just expect some rumblings, just expect, and, and then I'm such an optimist, so I'll, this is a silly thing to say, but it will all work out. And, uh, and know that, and you have your advisors, your financial advisors, and um, they're there to support you during this period, not just the week that you retire. They're, the, they're in it for the long haul. 
You know, Nancy, listening to you talk about transitions makes me think about the big transitions in my life. Um, being a, a career woman, then having children, then staying home for 10 years or so, um, then uh, going back to work and being an empty nester when my kids left, and then being a caregiver of uh, for my, my parents as they were ill and, and in hospice care. And um, it, it just really rings true that tra those transitions change you um, as your circumstances change. Um, and I wanted to uh, just get you to talk a little bit about those psychological changes or how you start to handle all of that in your life. I know, you know, at Corda we focus on the numbers and and preparing for retirement just, you know, in that way. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what you mentioned in your book is the psychological profile or psychological portfolio, excuse me. Uh, I was interviewing a man who was the CFO of a major Fortune 100 company. And uh, he had a pension of a million dollars, plus all of his other money. Money was not an issue, obviously. And he said to me, retirement is hollow. I said, what do you mean? He banged on the table. He said, that's solid. Retirement is hollow. I don't know who I am anymore. I've lost my purpose. I, I, my life is 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 not good anymore. I've lost my power to get things done. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me realize that at the same time, you have to examine and balance and rebalance your, your financial portfolio. You also have a psychological portfolio. And actually the title of one of my books, uh, Revitalizing Retirement, um, deals reshaping your identity, relationships, and purpose tells the story. The three things, and this is taking account of health and finances, uh, but that's not included in this. So you have to keep those things in mind. But your identity, you meet somebody. And when I was a professor, uh, what do you do? Well, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland. You don't even have to go into details or you can say you're a financial planner or a banker or a roofer or a judge, whatever. It's a shortcut and it sort of reflects part of your identity and how the world sees you. And when I first retired and I'm now in a new community, I can't spend my life saying I was a professor, so big deal. That was then, what's now? Uh, how do you introduce yourself? You all probably have cards, right? Business cards? Yes. Okay. I had a business card at Maryland with all kinds of things on it. And now I'm in a new community. What do I put on my business card? Um, and I've done in workshops a fun thing with the evolution of my own business cards from Maryland to today. And I've had about five different cards showing the, the it, it doesn't happen right away. And the evolution from a card that I made with absolutely nothing on it, except my name and my email, because I had no idea who I was, to my current card, <laughs> which is bright red. And, uh, talks about uh, what I'm doing, but it's it's a meta, the card is a metaphor for how you begin to identify yourself. So your identity is probably the most important thing. Related to your identity is your purpose. What gets you going? What makes you get up in the morning? Now I'm retired. I don't have to publish or perish. Oh, uh, uh, what do I do with myself? Um, a lot of people, like um, a reporter from the Baltimore Sun I interviewed for one of the books, 
he had no trouble with retirement. The first day he had set up his, his garage as an art studio and he identified himself as a painter. And he was set for that. He had been an amateur before. And when I followed up a year later, he had had his first show. He said, now I really am an artist, a painter, but he's a rare bird who knew exactly what he wanted to do and was set the day after. Many people don't know, well, how do you get dressed the first day of retirement? What do you wear? Um, your routines are, are totally changed. So what, if, what makes you get going in the morning? And how do you find or rediscover a lost dream or something that can help get you to have a new purpose, a new reason to get going? So purpose and purpose and identity are very, very tied to each other. Once you have a purpose, you begin to have a new identity. And then the third are relationships. Um, you all know each other very well. You work together. When you retire, now I've been retired for about 22 years. Um, I'm still in close touch with two colleagues who are really, were very close. But the many that I saw every day, over time, we've drifted in different ways along different paths. So you then have to get substitute communities, whether it's through a church, a community center, um, lifelong learning activities. I mean, there are many, many uh, ways, but this takes time. So you, you develop new, a new set of relationships. And the at home, I have to tell you a funny story. I was giving a speech in one of the um, Georgia universities. There two, I don't remember which one now. I don't remember whether it was the University of Georgia, but whatever. My husband came with me because there was a labor center and he was doing consulting with the labor center. Normally he didn't come on my business trips. So he came over to the speech. He's sitting in the front row, but nobody knows my husband is there. And during the Q&A, somebody said, we know since you've been retired, uh, how has that been with your husband? Well, I wasn't expecting the question, but I have to be authentic. So I said, it's been horrible. And I burst out laughing. I said, my <laughs> husband is in the front row <laughs> and I'll tell you what the problem has been. <laughs> He's laughing, I'm laughing, the whole audience is laughing. And it was true. What the problem was is that I had worked all along. I didn't take time off as you did to raise children. I worked all along and I was used to going and coming as I didn't check with anybody. I just lived my life. Suddenly I'm retired and Steve, where are you going? When will you be back? How, what are you doing? I said, I don't believe it. Suddenly uh, I, I'm in my late sixties and I have a supervisor. What, what is happening? And that really was a problem. Of course, the way we handle things, I, I developed a little operetta that if you keep asking me questions, I might do something to you. <laughs> so when he would start with, where are you going? When are you coming back? Anyway, it, you might not have that situation, but something will change with your significant others, with your family, with your children, what they expect of you. And one of the things that I think is very important, especially with adult ch with children who expect you to babysit and so forth, is to have an expectation exchange. What do you expect? And do that periodically because Steve expected me to report to him for the first time and I didn't want to. So uh, we survived that and now I wish he were back and supervising me. But um, it, each situation is 
different, but identity, re purpose, relationships. Does that make sense to the two of you? It, it does, uh, Nancy. We've got a couple of questions too around that subject. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask them now because I think it's a, it's a good timing. Um, good. The first one is, um, you, you, using you as, you as an example, you enjoyed your career as a professor. I would argue you're not retired, but, but uh, let's call it you are retired. You retired from that part of your life and that, that career. The question that comes from our client is, how did you know when ah, was the right time? Well, I'll tell you how I knew. Um, it never occurred to me. They did a buyout and my dean wouldn't let me take it. I didn't even want to. So it wasn't much on my mind, but there was a retirement party for an older woman at Maryland. Older, uh, I don't know what, but she looked old and she was old, but she was very vibrant and very active. But this is her retirement party. I am leaving the party and I happen to be in between two deans as we're walking across the campus and they are talking to each other. She should have retired 10 years ago. That's terrible to stay around this long. And they're going on and on about how old she is. And I said, they're never gonna say that about me. I'm gonna retire when they still want me, but I am not waiting for somebody to say, why did she hang on so long? That triggered it. That was the first trigger. The second, my husband was retired, but he was still busy and doing public speaking and so forth. Um, so there are a combination of, of things that happen, but I think for me, the trigger was that conversation. And then soon after that, I initiated uh, a retirement package. So, but each person again is so different. Um, you, you just know it when you know it. Um, you, Oh, well, there was one other thing in my teaching. I realized that I, I didn't think, I thought I was pretty sharp, but I would be talking and then you get diverted and you tell this story and that story. And I was having, it, it was not as easy for me. I, I felt, uh, that there was a little, that I, I guess I felt maybe I'm not quite as sharp in the classroom, but my students tell me that wasn't true. So there was just a little nag about that. Again, once again, we hear so much about our cognition. You want to make sure that you're not sticking around too long. Um, so there was, in my case, a lot of self-awareness of what will happen. And of course, when I retired, I never expected that I would have a resurgence. And with this pandemic, my career has, uh, has just blossomed again, uh, which is a big surprise for me. That's great advice. Follow your heart is what I'm hearing part of that. And, and also too, a little bit of go out on top. That was important to you. It may not be important to others, but to you, it was important to go out on top. The second question, Nancy, it revolves, I'll, I'll paraphrase uh, the, the question, but, it, but it's a great one because it talks about the difference in, in, in husband and wife. And in this particular question, um, one of the two is retired and happy that they retired. And the other one is a little bit below the traditional retirement age, uh, but financially they feel like they can retire, but the working spouse is nervous. And there's a little bit of a tension, it sounds like, between the two that they're not on the same page. So do you have any advice of well, maybe how to address that? Jeff, more and more I'm talking to people who are out of sync. For one thing, I think everything that I say about demographics is shifting. But a lot of times women have married men who are a little bit older than they. And I'm thinking of a case uh, of, a, of a couple I know where she is, it was a second marriage and he's a good deal older than she. 
and he's slowing down. He's he's still pretty terrific, but he's slowing down. She is emerging. She is ready to go, and she's getting uh, irritated at him. She doesn't want to get irritated. She doesn't mean to, but she is. And when I was doing research on these books, I did two on retirement. One woman said to me, her husband had been an architect. He was older than she, he was retired and she couldn't get him to do anything. And so I said, all right, I'll take the case. I said, I'm going to start a business. I said, now this is a joke. I never started this business, but the, the business was called nag.com. I will nag your husband. A, it will relieve my husband of my need to nag. And I will nag your husband to get reinvolved. And so what I did in this case is I got one of the lifelong learning institutes to establish a course in architecture. Then I convinced him to take it. Then I pay money and enroll so he'll at least have one student. Well, during this period, he said, Nancy, I don't think I really want to do it. I said, Richard, you are doing it. I said, I won't get my money from your wife if you don't do it. <laughs> well, the funny thing is people started hearing about this business and one woman called and said, I'd really like you to talk, nag my husband. I said, really, it's not a real business. But you know, when I think about it, Jeff, I wish I had done it. I could be making a fortune today. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, you could. And there's certainly, <laughs> a, there's certainly a demand for that. Uh, I, that's great. Uh, I think you've just identified a new career for me. Because <laughs> I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> yeah, and your husband will be so happy. <laughs> one quick shameless plug on the last question. We'll get to one more question before we move on. A, a quick shameless plug for Cordis Financial Planning. In the question, the client says they have gone through Cordis Financial Planning and, and uh, that whole process on the financial side and been very happy with the outcome, but there's still that tension. So uh, again, a little bit of a shameless plug for our financial planning. The finance side is one of it, uh, one side of it, but I do think it's a great question and something that's reality of uh, taking the leap of faith of retiring and knowing when that's right. The last question, Nancy, before we get to the final section is, um, which I think is an interesting and, and a good one, because you talk about, again, keeping your dance card full when you retire and having hobbies, and which I'm a big fan of, uh, and that I've seen uh, with retirees, it really helps. The question is, what if you don't feel like you have a real need for a new purpose uh, again, I, I think back to your situation, you retired as a professor, but, but maybe by accident, you developed this whole new career because you had a drive and a purpose. What if you, you're just, you're financially set, you retire at 65 and you don't have that drive or purpose? Well, do you know something? Um, and, and Kim, you and I have talked a little bit about the various paths people can take. And maybe this is a, a time to move into that because that will answer that question, I think. What do you think? I think that's great. I, I know what you have done and I know your personality is a go-getter, do things, plan things, get out there. But I know um, I know people and I know my personality and I'm, I think I'm more laid back. So I wonder how busy I wanna be in retirement. Maybe I don't wanna be just constantly going and doing. So if you would talk a little bit about that, I know you you address that in, in your books. And so Jeff, I think that gets us to um, the paths that people can take. And I think this puts it in perspective. There is no one path for everyone. First of all, personalities are different, circumstances are different. But I would like to share the paths that I think cover what most people think about. Keeping in mind that with longevity, you're gonna be retired for what? 15, 20 years, 25 years. So you've got a long way to live, a life to be lived. So I, again, through my interviews, identified 
six major paths. The first is a continuer. There are people who leave their job. I left being a professor. I do not teach anymore, but I still do talking and research and writing in the same area that I had done as a professor. So I have modified, but it's still within that same arena. I keep saying, I'm never gonna do another transition study. I'm not gonna write another book on transitions. And then I do. Uh, so I'm kind of addicted. And uh, so I'm a continuer. Then there are adventurers. And I don't mean somebody climbing the tallest mountain in the world. I mean someone who does something very different. And I'll tell you a little story on that one. Congress had a research group and the man who headed it up, um, I, I really don't, it, it, somebody told him to talk to me and I met him and he told me what had happened the whole research group was eliminated for financial reasons. So here he is in his early 60s with no career and too old to get another job like he had had, but too young to not work. And he was a sailor. So he went on a sailing trip by himself to just meditate and think about life. And he remembered, of course, he would remember that he had a tragedy in his life when his first wife died and a child died. And he was remarried at this point, but he remembered what got him through that. He went to a massage therapist and it just relaxed him and he came back from this trip announcing to his wife, I'm going to go to school and become a massage therapist. But she was really shocked. You know, here he was a suit tie briefcase guy, and now he's going to become a massage therapist, which he did. Hmm. And he found that that was a wonderful career, but he had also a lot of administrative talent. So he started working for the school. So he combined some of what he had done. At any rate, he died a few years later and his wife wrote to me. She said, I could not read your book because I knew that this case was in it, my husband. And I wanna tell you, it was very upsetting at first, but I am so proud that he did something he really wanted to do. And there are, are many cases of adventures, but it could be a house husband or a housewife who becomes a docent at a museum. It doesn't have to be some big romantic thing or some, but the massage therapist, but it's doing something new, something you've never done before. So that's the second one. Then there's the easy glider. The, and maybe that's you, Kim. That maybe that will be you. <laughs> I'm thinking that might be me. I have a list of books that I just want to sit and have the time to read. <laughs> well, I envy you because then it like, and it's a person who doesn't want an agenda, doesn't want a purpose, wants to let the day unfold and and take in whatever. And the easy gliders, I think, are the luckiest of all because. They're not searching for a new purpose. I mean, it, it's not me, but, but I'm, I'm glad to know somebody. Um, <laughs> then there are the involved spectators. These are people, uh, there are a lot of retired uh, museum directors where I live and they no longer run a museum but they're involved in art or a politician who's retired cannot can no longer walk the halls of Congress and becomes a news junkie. You're involved as a spectator. And when I mentioned this at a conference one day, somebody said, 
that's what I'm going to put on my card now. You can put on your card Easy Glider. <laughs> <laughs> this woman was going to put Involved Spectator. And I know what you're going to do, Jeff. I see some uh, instruments behind you, musical instruments. So you'll you'll go into the you'll go into rock and roll. I don't know what you're gonna do, but maybe start a new band. Who knows? <laughs> so then we we got then the searcher. We are all searchers, and there will be a time after you've easy glided, Kim. You're so easy. You're out glided yourself, and you will search for what's next, and. We're going to go through this several times. We're not going to go on one path. We live too long for that. We might combine paths and we might uh, change altogether. So searching, exploring, that's going to be part of our retirement life forever. You know, is there something I regret that I didn't do? Uh, what can I do? And then the last has two parts to it. Uh, the last, the retreater. There's the retreater who is using this as a moratorium. I don't want to get too involved. I want to sit back. I want to take my time. I'm going to retreat temporarily. And then there is the retreater who becomes a couch potato and addicted to television and, and really needs... Um, that nag.com <laughs> uh, <laughs> business. So that retreater, for many people, that can lead to depression. So all retreaters aren't going to become depressed. And most people at some time will step back. So those are, are the paths. And I don't know if that answers the question uh, that you asked earlier, Jeff. It does, as I think about the question and some of the context, you know, I look at it probably is the, in your definition, the easy glider. So I think the question, uh, again, I'm assuming a couple of things, but I, I think the question was, is it okay to be an easy glider? And I think what you've, what I'm hearing from you is, yes, it's okay. There's no real danger in any of those, except for the retreater, perhaps. And the reality of it is we may go from easy glider to adventure uh, a couple of different times in retirement. I, so, so I think what I'm hearing from this, it's just important to understand that. Right. There's no, oh, and, and by the way, if I were to describe myself, it clearly is a continuer, but with a little bit of easy gliding, I love going to the beach and watching the sunset. So that I do often. So we, we combine certain things and we're not going to be on one path forever. And I think, um, there's life just has a way of unfolding and i a, a man i know uh and i'm not i don't think he's alive anymore a professor from stanford wrote a book that i think is very important called planned happenstance in other words most of us deal with happenstance but can you grab hold of it uh i have can you, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about luck, but it, we all face things, but if we're smart enough and open enough to take advantage of, of opportunities that we would never have thought of and say yes instead of no when you're invited to do something. Um, volunteer, try new things. Um, hoping that something will grab you that makes you feel satisfied with what you're doing. And if that isn't, you'll search the more, explore the more. It's not over till it's over. It's great advice, Nancy. One last question on our, on our Q and A uh, um, chat here. It, it, the, it, the question, or there's kind of two parts. One, it, it will, this will be recorded. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this. Uh, earlier. This is being recorded. You'll, you'll get a, um, a recording of this automatically in the next day or so, and then you can forward it out. So that'll be good. The question is really, you touched on it earlier, Nancy, with um, 
you know, maybe becoming the babysitter, perhaps as, as somebody in retirement for your children's children. Um, the question is really kind of, do you have any guidance, maybe specific guidance around sort of how to have that conversation? You touched on having rules, uh, because I do think that's a reality. And what I see a lot is people work their entire lives. Maybe they're thinking easy glider and then they have a grandbaby and they become a full-time sort of caretaker uh, and, and babysitter. So do you have any uh, advice on the rules for that? Well, and people are so different. Um, I have a very young grand, I have three grandchildren, but I have a very young 10 year old. And I call her other grandmother, the real grandmother, because her life is getting on the floor, doing art projects. What she likes doing more than anything is being with this darling little girl. I love the little girl, but that is, I cannot picture myself getting everything all my pleasure from being with her. Um, but the, my co-grandmother, the co-grandmother who I call the real get grandmother, there is nothing she would rather do, nothing. Now, um, your question is, I mean, some people really, that becomes their life goal, their life purpose. But if your family expects you to do one thing, and you're not sure you want to do it, you have to be able to set boundaries and set limits. That for many people is very difficult, especially with your own children to say, no, that's, that's not in the cards for me. Um, I really am doing X, Y, or Z. That's not easy. And sometimes you need the support of a third person. And Jeff, I think one of the things would be wonderful if you found, and I don't know Texas, and we all know Texas today, and we're sorry for what you're going through. Um, but <clears throat> if there were a group of career counselors that could be, you could connect with, and we can talk about this afterwards, there's the National Career Development Association, and um, maybe I can be of some help find, helping you find. I think it would be great to have people you could refer some of your clients to. And look what they're doing with collaborative divorce now. In collaborative divorce, it's, it's the financial person, it's uh, a social worker, a counselor, I mean, they get all the disciplines together because the questions that some of your clients are asking are really would be best helped by a, a counselor or social worker, someone who could help that person figure out some of these questions. I mean, you've raised the out of sync husband and wife, uh, parents, um, adult children and parents. I mean, there are all kinds of relationship questions. So I would think that would be great if you had people you felt were really competent and that you would feel free referring to. So that um, is, my, is my advice. Yeah, it's a good answer. It's, it's tricky. There's no easy answer there. Communication is a key and bringing in a third party if you need to certainly is helpful. So thank you, Nancy. That's it for the questions. Nancy and, and our clients, um, we're kind of reaching our time limit. We want to respect that you have other things to do today. Um, I want to thank Dr. Schlossberg for spending this time with us today. I think she's inspired us to have a more happy um, retirement and, and to be thinking about these things as, as we go into that transition. Um, I know there's so much more she could tell us about and so much more advice. Um, hopefully we could talk her into coming back another time and we'll sure let you know about that. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I also wanna thank our clients. Um, we appreciate your interest in this topic. Um, again, we hope to have more on this. Um, and I want to let you know that 
this is one of the many books that Nancy has written and Corda would like to send you a free signed copy if you'd like one. Um, please let your relationship partner know that you'd like a book and we'll get one sent out to you. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank Jeff Dodson, my coworker, uh, for all of his efforts in getting all of this organized today. Um, I know I've enjoyed this visit and we're looking forward to hosting some more speakers at Corda um, in the year to come, in the months to come. So thank you again for everybody for attending. Thank you for your time and take care. We're gonna, we're gonna conclude the meeting here. Thank you all, take care. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, thank you.